when a joint committee of the city bureaucrats and prominent Bostonians were appointed by Mayor Augustus Martin to promote the erection of an equestrian statue to the memory of Paul Revere in one of the city squares. Probably adjacent to Trinity Church, uh, which we you know, now know as Copley Square. Well, Francis Nell, um, Dallas' biographer, described the half century that it took to realize Paul Revere's statue as really an injustice to a young sculptor who had rightly earned the commission. Indeed, it really wasn't wasted time these 57 years because it allowed Dallin, Dallin the opportunity to mature and to perfect his work. The first design took six weeks, truly a remarkable feat for so young a sculptor. The second version, uh, if you look up at the screen, I've got them organized um, chronologically. The second version was completed in only three weeks, even more impressive. The third version, which Dallin considered his favorite, represents four months of dedicated effort. The exact time allotted to each of the later versions is uncertain, but based on the evidence, Dallin worked on each one for over a period of four months to a year, um, while he was completing other work at the same time. All told, Dallin probably spent less than four years developing his masterpiece in terms of the actual time working on the piece. This is rather remarkable when you consider how many years it took to realize some of our other great monuments. St. Gaudens devoted 14 years to the sculpture of the Shaw Memorial, perhaps the greatest work of figurative public sculpture in the country. The Shaw Memorial was begun just about the same time that Dallin submitted his earliest designs for the Paul Revere statue, and it was unveiled across the street from the State House on the Boston Common in 1897. Uh, when Dallin's uh, still working on his fourth model. Similarly, Daniel Chester French devoted 11 years to developing the Lincoln Memorial. I should note that the history of this memorial began 10 years, actually began 10 years earlier in 1909, when four of the country's leading uh, artists and architects um, proposed this particular location for a memorial to Lincoln. So, Dallin begins. In 1883, um, Waiting for the Lights is the title of this piece. It's based on Longfellow's poem of Paul Revere's Ride. This um, source was prescribed by the commission, by the organizers of the competition. There were eight submissions that were submitted for a blind competition that included much more mature artists such as Daniel Chester French. The first three winners were to receive $300. This was a substantial sum for uh, a young artist, and Dallin won. He was one of the three that was selected. However, winning did not guarantee acceptance, and it was expected that other des designs would be accepted. In particular, they were waiting for Thomas Ball, who had erected the George Washington Monument in the Boston Garden that was so popular. Despite the poetic inspiration, all the winning entries were deemed historically inaccurate. In fact, it was Longfellow who had set them up to fail, as they all chose the same moment in the poem that actually would not happen in real life. Uh, Revere did not wait to see the lantern aloft from the Belfry Arch, but from other symbols, he knew that the red coats were coming, and thus he set, set out to set sound the alarm. While this fault could not rest fully on the sculptors, another claim against French and Dallin was that their work was too dependent on Thomas Ball's statue of George Washington in the garden. Still, one crit critic at least warranted that Dallin was successful in suggesting the dignified ease of attitude, which is so desirable and fashionable among equestrian statues. And with this piece, very, very soon in the uh, press, he received a challenge. Uh, yet another Boston Daily Globe critic compared Dallin's piece to that of Daniel Chester French, remarking that Dallin's sculpture was less animated in pose and expression than French's model. And perhaps it was upon reading this that Dallin decided that he would ask the committee chairman for permission to create a second model, which you see here. This model he did in three weeks. This work was then submitted for a runoff competition among the three winners, which included Dallin, uh, Daniel Chester French, 
and another sculptor. However, at that point, no decision was still made. When exhibited at the Boston, Garden, Boston Art Club in the August, August of 1883, the response to the second model was most favorable. I quote, the new model presents Revere on his horse with a very spirited, unconventional, and vividly dramatic pose and gesture. Reining back his excited steed, the midnight messenger points with the right straight arm in the direction he has come, and his tense and anxious face almost speaks the message that he bears for each farmhouse by the way. The action and story of the statue are powerfully given, and the whole strikes the eye as singularly fresh, earnest, and original. Dallin's second model was accepted into an exhibition of contemporary American art at the Museum of Fine Arts as well, and again well received. However, Dallin was labeled as a neophyte, one who had got ahead of himself um, in terms of the veterans in the, on the scene. And in particular, um, he was lauded for his ability to capture the speed and motion of his group. However, the great qualified his endorsement, suggesting that Dallin had, in fact, outdone himself. Quote, it is certainly a remarkable piece of work for so young a man, one of those things that makes one fear that it may be too good, as promising more than performance can be deemed in the future. At least one visiting Italian professor had a different reaction to Dallin's work at the time, and he predicted that Dallin would become one of the foremost sculptors in America. However, the committee didn't quite see that, and they shared the doubts of the critics, and no contract was offered, despite the fact that Dowling had, in fact, won two separate blind competitions for the commission. In less than two months, Dowling had created two very worthy models for an equestrian monument to one of our nation's great patriots, a remarkable achievement for one so young. And you see him here, uh, so fresh and young. Making a model is one thing, of course, but creating a full-scale monument is yet another. Nonetheless, Dallin was fully confident in his ability, having been nurtured to believe in himself and encouraged to pursue his art since the age of 14 when he decided that he would become an artist. Dallin was also thwarted by the public announcements against his work by his former teacher, uh, Truman Bartlett, and you see him uh, with that wonderful moustache in the center, looking straight out at you, resting his arm on the pedestal there. Dallin had left Bartlett's studio under unpleasant circumstances. Added to this was the fact that Bartlett's own son, an accomplished sculptor, had lost out to Dallin in the first competition. So Bartlett was not inclined to be generous in his thinking towards Dallin and his sculpture. The strong words of Bartlett, a respected artist and connoisseur of the Boston community, greatly discouraged the public from supporting the project. Bartlett described Dallin's sculpture as, and I quote, the most outrageous piece of effrontery and lack of intelligence on the committee's part to have selected the model. It is an impossible man on an impossible horse. The author is but a young man from Utah who has never done and will never do anything worthwhile. Now, there was some truth to these words. Uh, while in Bartlett's studio, Dallin created work similar to the one you see on the screen. Now, this is a copy of a work by the French sculptor Valet, the Algerian Panther, that dates to 1880. Dallin produced this piece and sold copies to earn extra money. And at the time, with Bartlett's encouragement, he also worked in the Boston Terracotta Company. However, this is not enough to sustain him, and he left to work with the sculptor Sidney Morris in Quincy, where he made cemetery statues and released for a granite company. Morris encouraged Dallin to develop in other ways. He introduced him to Goethe, Emerson, and Count Kant. This working relation lasted until September of 1882, when there wasn't enough work for those sculptors, and Dallin went back to Boston. Not long after this was when the Revere competition began, and as he has seen, after two years of trying to satisfy the committee and raise public interest in the statue, um, nothing happened. In the hopes of securing commissions back home, Dallin returned to his hometown of Springville, Utah, in Salt Lake in February of 1884. His stay there would be brief because the committee wanted to negotiate again. 
asking for additional changes, which Downey readily um, worked out. Downey completed the first rendition of his third model of the Revere in August. But the committee found it unsat unsatisfactory, so we had to work on it again until November when he resubmitted it. Downey's third design even surpassed his own expectations, and the committee almost unanimously voted to award the contract to Dallin. Part of the willingness certainly came from the judgment solicited from some 20 prominent artists who offered the following praise. And these are quotes. The horse is marvelous. The pose is splendid. Another stated that the general effect surprised me as being very speaking and decidedly monumental. Another declared that it was a spirited work of art, and if carried out, can make a statue of which we should be proud. And in the Boston Advertiser, the critic wrote that it was dashing, well-studied, effective, and enthusiastic. At last, the terms of the contract were worked out, allowing Dallin two years to complete the monument for which he would receive $25,000. The city had already donated the site and appropriated $5,000 to be paid out upon completion of the monument. The only thing that was left was to raise $20,000 by public subscription. However, the Alpha Mayor also failed to sign the contract, and it was rendered invalid. Essentially, a new contract would need to be drafted under then Mayor Hugh O'Brien in 1885. The lack of funds would continue to play the project. Incompetence. If confidence in Dallin and his work was to be restored, Bartlett's criticism needed to be countered. Dallin approached America's most noted sculptor at the time, Augustus St. Gaudens, who was then working on the Shaw Memorial, which we have seen, and asked if he might offer some encouraging words to the committee. St. Gaudens' response was generous, though he was hesitant to provide full approval. He wrote, I think the horse is very good and strong, and certainly if carried out as shown, would be a work not to be ashamed of. The writer, I must frankly say, I do not like, and I think he could do better. There is so much that is good in the horse, and it shows so clearly that you have a good sculptor's conception of form, that I think with time and no worry, you might make a credible figure, to say the least. It seems to me that as the matter is of such importance to you, that an offer on your part to put up the work full size and ask that the committee pay your expense only until that is done and reject the work of unsatisfactory would make so small an outlay that they might consider it. Or better still, you might make other studies of the man until satisfied. No doubt, Down accepted St. Gaudens criticism graciously and made subsequent changes to the Revere. The project was still stalled. Dowling's life changed when the relative of his fiance gave Down the money to study abroad. Dowling signed an extension of the Revere contract and left for Paris. Dallin's art education in Paris was decidedly different than his tenure with Bartlett. He entered the Academy Julianne, where he studied under noted sculptor Henri Michel Chapeau. Chapeau was a formative influence on Dallin, as Dallin recalled. Chapeau did much for me. He was a rare spirit. When he put his hand on my shoulder, he seemed to send an occult influence into my soul. It made me feel that life was good to live, just to meet him and hear his criticism of my work. The ability in him to recognize beautiful finished work made you feel that in you might be the same element. Chapeau's paternal manner is further reflected in the advice that he regularly gave his students. Cherche la beauté, mes enfants. Search for beauty, my children. Years later, when Dallin became a teacher at Mass Normal School, today's Mass College of Art, it was Chapeau's example, not Bartlett's that Dallin would follow, and which would earn him the nickname of Cyrus the Great, great from his students. While in Paris, Dallin created his second equestrian sculpture, the Lafayette, which was commissioned by an American dentist as a gift to France from the American people. While the sculpture was exhibited at the 1889 Paris Exposition, it was never enlarged to double life as initially planned, and Dallin's hopes of erecting a heroic equestrian statue were once again defeated. Nonetheless, Dallin had other valuable opportunities to pursue equestrian subjects as Buffalo Bill and his Wild West Company were in town. Dallin's portrayal of a friendly Sioux chief on his pony won an honorable mention at the 
Paris Salon of 1890 and his first international recognition. Life-size, the work proved that Dow would effectively translate his small-scale models to full size. It's modeled in a, a wonderful, simple naturalism, which is really counter to um, the clever surface techniques that the French were known of at the time. And the local press acclaimed the work as the first distinctive American statue ever exhibited at the Salon. And that same year, Dallin returned to Boston and to his Revere project. Unfortunately, the model that had won the contract, uh, the third rendition of the statue, that model was lost when he was in Paris, and so we had to begin a new model. Although the modeling and the surface technique of this um, version is more refined, reflecting his European training, the stiff leg pose of the horse is less successful, in my view, as a composition for the subject, and there was no advance in the proceedings. In the meantime, however, Dallin was having success with other important commissions through the um, LDS Church in Utah. At 12 and one half feet, this was the first monumental work that Dallin created. Shortly after the well, Moroni's sculpture was dedicated, the church commissioned the monument to the late church leader Brigham Young. While Dallin readily produced the design, and the, the church took more than eight years to raise the funds, thereby stalling this project as well. As a result of the lack of funds, uh, Dallin's original plan was compromised, and he was greatly disappointed at the end result, which we see here. Dallin argued in vain to have the monument corrected, even at his expense. His main concern over his own financial well-being was that the monument looked as well as possible. To Dallin's disappointment, the improvement that he sought was never carried out. Dallin is equally well known for his Epic of the American Indian, a series of four life-size equestrian statues that capture the dignity and nobility of the American Indian. In this he created the series in an effort to expose the evolving plight of the Native Americans who he said when he was a young boy, the talk and the meaning of friendship. We have already seen the signal of peace, um, and here is the second in this group, uh, the apprehensive medicine man. This is the seer of the Crow tribe, who warned his people of the dangers of the white man. This piece was well received in Europe, winning a silver medal at the International Expo of 1900, as well as at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo that same year. Some have considered this to be Dallin's best work and one of the most significant products of American sculpture. After his success in Europe, Dallin returned to Boston to take a teaching job at the Mass Normal Art School to resume his efforts to realize a monument to Paul Revere. He modified his stiff leg model in an attempt to duplicate the lost third model's successful pose. This version was formally approved and the critical reception seemed to guarantee that the project would soon advance towards completion. The statue is described in the press as much improved. Quote, the mobility and dramatic force are well blended with harmonious lines and rhythmic poise. The horse, suddenly pulled up by his rider, is a, a most spirited and picturesque type of rest and movement, and the attitude and gesture of the man tell the stirring, stirring story of Revere's errand without violence, or bombast. Despite the positive reception, once again the project failed to advance, and in 1907, Dallin sold the 1899 model to the Caponi Brothers, um, a plaster casting firm in, in Boston. It was a firm that he worked with regularly. Dallin was paid $100 for his model. He received a free model and royalties of $10 each on every reproduction that was sold. Several hundred copies uh, of this were made, being distributed to schools, institutions, municipalities. Now in this way, Dallin was really more than compensated for his efforts on the Revere, and his model was to become a popular image nationwide for this revolutionary war hero. Two years later, the appeal to the Great Spirit um, was created. His biographer, Francis Nell, read this uh, tribute to the Native American as Dallin's own disappointment and frustration in his bitter dealings with untrustworthy white men, and in particular, politicians of 
bureaucrats. <laughs> However, many of the problems came from bad luck. A mayor neglects to sign a contract before leaving office, a disgruntled critic robs the project of all hope of public funding. However, Dell maintained faith in the project and quietly worked on the Revere model over the years. It is unclear how long Dallin worked on the piece, um, the six model that you see here. Um, but based on his wife's diary, we know that he began a new version of the cape in 1912. And you see that cape in the center. Again, Dallin adopts a stick like pose for his horse and introduces a curl of the forelock to su suggest added movement and the play of the wind. It was said that Dallin uncovered the statue at least once a year on the anniversary of Paul Revere's ride. If there were any doubts as to whether or not Dallin could successfully carry out monumental bronze, he was offering many assurances through other commissions, though this particular commission was once again stalled. Here we see a 10 foot bronze, the scalp from 1914. And then the Massasoit, nine and a half foot bronze. It's a wonderful image with Dallin standing next to it, but it can give you a sense of the scale. This is a version from 1920. It was a theme that he had first explored in 1911, and it's in Plymouth. And here we have the eight foot bronze of Anne Hutchinson, which is here in Boston, um, right outside of the State House. Besides the Revere Monument, there were other equestrians that were never realized. We see down here the statue of General Oliver Howard. At least 13 equestrian um, military subjects were undertaken by Dallin, um, all studies for potential monuments, but only one of them was ever enlarged to heroic proportions. However, he had great success in realizing his equestrian monuments um, that were attributed to Native Americans. There was also a ready market and tabletop versions of these for the middle class. His military subjects really had a limited market, and without the interest of using the monumentation, they just really never got underway. By 1935, finally, there was added an incentive to see the Revere project through. It was the 200th anniversary of the birth of Paul Revere. The seventh model duplicated the action of the 1884 statue but with a little bit more refinement and subtle control. The earlier model had been his favorite, the third one, and he still didn't know how he did it, guessing that there might have been something psychic in it. He didn't really believe that he could do better now, but he did. Dallin finally decided to follow the advice of Augustus St. Gaudens that he had offered nearly half a century before. That was to create, at his own expense, a statue in heroic dimensions, even though there was no promise of financial support from the public. He completed the enlargement to two and one half feet in just four months, with the assistance of his 30-year-old son, Lawrence. Dowling was then in his late 70s. Remarkable. This is really a remarkable feat for a man of his age. It required three tons of clay to model this, this, um, this ten and one half foot statue. It was exhibited at Old State House, and Dowling issued an appeal to the citizens of Boston from the creator of the appeal to the great spirit. Seventh version uh, returns to the 1884 design that he had preferred. And then in 1934, he made some corrections to the upraised foot of this model to correct an error that he had finally detected. You see, it took all that time for him to see what could be better. As I said, he did this in four months. By this time, he had created five live or over live equestrian statues and was clearly able to accomplish the feat. Remarkably, despite despite the anniversary and public interest, the project continued to lag. Thus, in 1937, Dallin offered the Revere to Arlington, as it was this city um, was on the path of the Patriots' ride and was also Dallin's hometown. The likelihood of losing this structure to Arlington added new vigor to the project, and once again, the city and Dallin entered into negotiations. As public funds continued to be the issue, Dallin petitioned the George White, Robert White Fund to support the project. Though they had denied the project in the past as not in line with their mission, 
Dali was able to convince them that his sculpture satisfied their guidelines, and the sculpture was finally installed in September of 1940. Although Dali had anticipated receiving at least 30,000 for his monument, most of the money was lost to graft. Nonetheless, the Potter Beard is truly a fitting legacy for a sculptor of Dali's character and abilities. To learn more about Dallin and his contributions to American art and culture, I invite you to go to the Dallin Museum in Arlington. I'll show you an image of it here. Um, it was created to preserve this rich, le rich legacy that he left us, and as I said, it's open to the public, and it's free. Uh, you can look online and, and see what their hours are. People come from all over the world to visit, and I encourage you to do um, that someday soon. Thank you very much.